absolutely my pleasure. Um, I've been tasked with the difficult job of keeping us on time today and curve our enthusiasm, but we've got a great lineup of speakers. So without further ado, let me introduce our um, speaker of the day, um, Mr. Ivan Krostev. He's the chairman for liberal strategies in Sofia, permanent fellow at Institute of Human Sciences in Vienna, founding board member of the European Council on Foreign Relations. He has well published in journals and books his most recent book was, Is It Tomorrow Yet? How the Pandemic Changes Europe, which was published in 2020. And he's been very productive while other, other places have taken kind of a back seat during the pandemic. He is here, he's done uh, TED books as well as a wonderful, delightful TED talk uh, in, a few, uh, in the last couple of years. He's won numerous awards for some of the essays that he, he's written here today. Um, and we are so delighted to have him and talk to us today about sovereignty. So Yvonne, thanks for being here and please take it away. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. And unlike most of you, I have never been doing a serious research on sovereignty. So this is why. At least you know what is a keynote speaker, somebody who do not dare to be on a panel. Uh, uh, but what I'll try to do uh, is uh, to try to use particularly uh, the Russia-Ukrainian crisis to go back in the last 30 years and to try to uh, look at the fact to what extent this crisis is helping us to see how some of our definition of sovereignty in the last 30 years worked or not. And when uh, I said this, I very much also uh, referred to some that Paulo said, the previous crisis with the pandemic was very much about the sovereignty or autonomy of the individual and anti uh, vax movement, uh, anti-COVID restrictions, what it means to be a sovereign individual, how far the state can go. There was a big debate uh, and that comes uh, this kind of a crisis, which is a strange crisis, because in a certain way, it forces us to see many of the developments in Europe in the last 30 years, much more in the prospect of decolonization than a classical democracy versus authoritarianism. And as a result of it, I'll try to basically start with a very simple question. What we got probably wrong in our understanding of sovereignty uh, and this is why we ended basically so surprised by certain things that we're seeing today. And my first argument is that the first thing that we got wrong is that we took the end of the Cold War, the end of communism, and the disintegration of the Soviet Union to be the same thing. Just three words for the same things, and we basically believe that they happened at the same time. And historically, it was not true. In a certain way, when basically Fukuyama wrote his famous The End of History article in the March of 1989, Soviet Union was there, and no, no many people expected it to collapse. Even in December 1990, uh, the Pentagon uh, senior panel on Soviet Union declared that the chances for the Soviet disintegration was about 30%. So in a certain way, the end of communism happened already in a previous system and the end of the Cold War, and this is part of my central argument is, it was the post-Cold War European order was not co-founded by the West and Russia. It was co-founded by the West and the Soviet Union. And Soviet Union was a very different type of a state with a totally different type of affairs. When uh, President Gorbachev basically decided to end the Cold War and to go for the Paris Charter and basically all the major documents that we're citing today, one of the major objectives of his joining the international order was the hope to, solve, to save the Soviet Union as a post-communist state exactly because there was a strong nationalistic movement in the republics. For him, the liberal order that is basically trying to downgrade the importance of the state sovereignty, make liberal order so attractive to Gorbachev. And listen, and if you go back to history and in many of the presentation, there was a lot of talk about historical trajectories. Russian empire survived after 1917 being basically remodeled as the Soviet Union, exactly as redefining <laughs> what is the meaning of the sovereignty of the different republics of different regions. So Gorbachev basically rightly believed that the best way to save the Soviet Union after the end of communism was to become part of the international order, which is not going to be interested in Soviet disintegration. 
And to be honest, he was right. One of the major ally for Gorbachev's vision was the American president, George Bush Sr., who went to Kiev and said, do not go independent because Americans were really fearing very much, particularly nuclear proliferation. So what we're kind of getting wrong is that for these people, for Soviet leaders of this period, the end of communism and the end of Cold War meant the end of the Soviet Union, just the opposite. For Gorbachev, he agreed on the end of the Cold War as the way to preserve Soviet Union. And then in 1992, two new type of political actors emerge on the European stage. They're basically on the same age. European Union, as we know it after Maastricht, a much more kind of a integrated type of a political actor than ever before. And post-communist Russia, uh, a former empire which didn't know either its borders or its identity or even its national day. So from this point of view, imagine that we're discussing sovereignty in two totally different laboratories. One in which sovereignty is redefined in terms of the process of integration. This was the EU story. And the other in which sovereignty was reinterpreted and redefined in the laboratory of disintegration. And this was the post-Soviet space. And you ended up, by the way, there was only uh, East European countries that have been partially being present in both kind of a, uh, uh, laboratories because for particularly much more conservative political forces in Poland or Hungary, but particularly Poland, joining NATO and European Union was uh, not the idea to go for the concept of shared sovereignty, but much more basically to regain sovereignty getting out of the Soviet bloc. And for them, this was the only guarantee for this to happen. Why I'm saying this, because you have this type of a perspective from the European point of view, when you look at the world from the laboratory of integration, you see in Europe only two types of formations, either kind of a future member states or failed states, like in former Yugoslavia, because there was a new process of a state building, which was based on a totally different idea of sovereignty, different than a classical nation state. And the failed states basically places where there is no legitimacy, problem with territory integrity and others. What you see from Russian point of view, and for me, this is quite important, is something different. The first shock, and President Putin is a great example of this, is what Russia realized that you can be nuclear power without being sovereign. In a certain way, you have the disintegration of the Soviet Union in the absence of war, and military defeat. In the 1990s, in terms of which Putin is going to formulate himself, Russia was not a sovereign state. So from this point of view, it's not what is sovereignty, but who is sovereign and how you realize it's sovereign. Why Russia was not a sovereign state? Three things from the Russian point of view, why they were not a sovereign state. And this is going to explain also certain things that they did. The first is because of the foreign indebtedness, IMF as being the major symbol of Russia being not a, uh, uh, not a, a sovereign state. Uh, to a certain extent, this allows a major economic uh, impact on the decision-making in the country. So as a result of it, in all 20 years in power, President Putin made a total obsession. He has a total obsession and kind of a magical thinking about external reserves. Uh, you're going to be surprised that in the time of COVID, when all of our governments were spending like in a war, he was saving like in a pre-war situation. In a COVID, Russia increased its external dollar reserve, not dollar, but external currency reserves by 200 billion. So for him to be sovereign means that you are not indebted. One of the paradoxical stories that he decided to put his reserves in the American and European banks, so it doesn't work too well for him on this level, but you're going to understand to what extent the experience of what means not to be sovereign. The second is not being sovereign for him means having no capacity or willingness to resist the United States. It, having no capacity or willingness to resist the United States. This is the definition of... Uh, sovereignty in the 1990s. And thirdly, the lack of cultural identity and the national-minded elites. So 
in my view, this is quite important because they come to the second paradox. In the 1990s, Russia was not sovereign, but Russia has a sphere of influence that was recognized by the West. And some colleagues here know this period not better than me, uh, but the international community did everything to preserve the illusion that Russia is a major great power to the extent that if you go in all major conflicts on the territory of the post-Soviet Union, you're going to see a Russian peacekeepers everywhere. So in a way, de facto, Russia was not sovereign, but it was the West did everything basically in order to keep uh, the self-confidence, uh, particularly during the Eltsin period, uh, to keep something that looks like a classical sphere of influence. You're going to have all these peacekeepers in Georgia, you're going to see them in Pridnestrovia and places like this. So then coming out of this period, basically, Russia defined sovereignty not as a right, but as a capacity. Very few states have the capacity to be sovereign. And as a result of it, these capacities have been four, five. It's going to end five, but it started as four. The first, in order to be sovereign, you should be military powerful. On this, it was the thing that Russia basically was doing better. The second is you need certain level of economic autonomy. And from this point of view, it was not simply uh, uh, the external reserves, but basically trying to create a certain level of economic self-sufficiency was critically important. And this is why the export substitution policies and others have been very much uh, developed in this tradition. Russia, as you know, became one of the biggest producers of food, particularly grain and others, because this was part of the understanding of sovereignty, very much classical 19th century classical nation state. The third, and this is very important, was nationalized, nationally minded elites. And the idea to produce a nationally minded elite before we started to be unhappy with the Russian oligarchs uh, in London, uh, Putin became unhappy with the Russian oligarchs uh, in London if they're not ready to show their loyalty to the regime directly. So after Crimea, you have the right to steal only if part of your money and your families are back in the country. For example, after Crimea, you cannot be a member of the Russian government if your kids are not back. Even Lavrov basically was forced to bring back her daughter uh, from New York. This nationalization of the elite goes on different levels. And to be honest, from this point of view, being on the Western sanction list was one the way to prove that you really belong uh, uh, to the Russian nation. Uh, I'm saying this is an anecdote, but uh, one, after one of the sanctions regime, uh, one of the famous economic figure in Russia, we had a quote and he said, why are you doing this to me? And I said, but you are not on the list. And he said, this is what I mean. <laughs> uh, so, uh, and this force is a problem of national identity. And for Russia, this was not an easy story. And by the way, for Putin, it is not an easy story. Uh, we talk about the restoration of Russian empire or the restoration of Soviet Union as if this is the same project. Uh, in July last year, president of the Russian Federation wrote an essay, 70,000 words. He wrote it himself. He did a research work. He was the archives to be brought to him. He was reading original documents, and this is the famous essay in which he claimed that Russians and Ukrainians are the same people. This is, by the way, a very important document. And this is one of the documents in which you start to talk about cultural identity in terms which is just the opposite of what we are going to define identity today. Ukrainians, from his point of view, Ukrainians, he has a wrong idea who they are. <coughs> because the idea of identity is not simply how you feel, this is the result of a big and long history, and he knows better than them how they feel. And this was critically important because if you believe that sovereignty is capacity, then you look at places like Ukraine, you say they do not have the capacity to be sovereign, and then there are just two options. They can be either Western protectorate or our protectorate. And in my view, this understanding of sovereignty and particularly, and this is much more questioned, how the idea of sovereignty relies to the idea of the spheres of influence is critically important. If you believe, and this goes slightly with the Chinese idea that they are big states and small states and they cannot be sovereign in the same way, 
uh, for the Russians. Of course, this essay didn't help the Russian operation in Ukraine because if President Putin was right, then when the Russian uh, uh, soldiers go to Ukraine, the people are going to meet them with flowers. They didn't because he was not ready to think about what happened in the Soviet Union in terms of decolonization and basically see the emergence of a new nation. Uh, from this point of view, the Kenyan ambassador in the United Nations was the one that best captured what is around. He saw this as a recolonization war. You have an empire coming back. You have a former empire who remembered themselves as being a nation state. And this, in my view, is very important in our understanding of sovereignty, because from our point of view, shared sovereignty also means that there was not severe of influence. From the Russians, the expansion of NATO and the EU was the expanding of the Western sphere of influence. And then they believed that, okay, they lost the Cold War, so they're going to lose Poland, Hungary, or even Bulgaria, but there was a border. And from this point of view, and this is my last point on sovereignty uh, in the post-communist uh, period, is that sovereignty also in the European uh, defining in the laboratory of integration means that the border between foreign and domestic policy is quite open. Interference in the domestic politics of others is how Europe functions. And this is why the centrality of human rights, this is why the sovereignty of individual is more important than the sovereignty of the nation state. Of course, from the Russian point of view, this is the famous idea of the regime change. So I want to end up is because seeing it from this point of view, what you see in Ukraine today is a clash of two totally different ideas of the meaning of sovereignty after the end of the Cold War. And honestly speaking, both of them are going to have uh, problems, these notions of sovereignty when it comes to the next period. In the European Union, this is seen in the fact that uh, in our idea of sovereignty, we are seeing really only failed states and the future member states. So we are either surrounded by friends or we are surrounded by fire, as Carol Bildt has said, because there is no place for kind of traditional nation states in this view. In the Russian states, you're basically either part of Russia or your frozen conflict. And this is basically what they have uh, in a certain way. We are talking a lot about what is happening in Ukraine. Meanwhile, Belarus was annexed by Russia, de facto. And this is why we, when we talk only in the terms of democracy versus autocracy, and I know that this is not the very popular argument that I'm going to put, I'm going to claim that even if Ukraine was authoritarian state, but anti-Russian, Putin is going to destroy it in this, with the same willingness he's doing it now. Because in a certain way, it's very much about the definition of what it means to be sovereign in the neighborhood of a great power. And this is important. In the Soviet period, there was a term which uh, uh, Mr. Brezhnev uh, introduced as, uh, after the 1968 in Czechoslovakia, the idea of limited sovereignty. So Soviet allies were sovereign to the extent they were loyal to socialism. In the moment they basically decided to break the principle of socialism, then Soviet Union has the international obligations to go and kind of to correct their sovereignty. The problem is how you're defining the limited sovereignty in a kind of a post-ideological age. And this is the problem of Russia really struggling with the problem of how to define its imperial identity in a period which is much more post-imperial than post-communist. Uh, 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 post, uh, 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 and I'm ending on this because today there was a very important kind of a proof that this type of uh, understanding of the conflict in, uh, in Ukraine probably is not uh, uh, simply uh, uh, my personal obsession. And then I have only one last point to make. The Republic of Uzbekistan, not famous for its democratic credentials. If they're democratic, they're not at least passionately about this. Declared that they're not going to recognize any changes of the borders of Ukraine and how loyal they are to the basically sovereignty of Ukraine. Because for them, this is the conflict in a classical post-colonial term because their own nationhood was born out of the Soviet disintegration. And they don't think about this in terms of democracy authoritarianism because this is not where democracy basically is something that is important for them. The last point of this, and I do believe this is quite important in this Putin's understanding of sovereignty, and it has a lot to do with certain processes that we see in the European continent. This is 
the idea between sovereignty and demography. And this is where the new thing that they can put here. In the last three months, President Putin three times made the same statement. He said, if it was not for the revolution, it was not for the disintegration of the Soviet Union, there were going to be 500 million Russians in the world. As you know, Russia is suffering demographic decline, which is not unknown to other East European countries, being Bulgarian, we overperforming. But in the case of Russia, of course, you have a demographic decline, which is very much taking place in a very big space. And this is why the idea of the civilizational state. This is why all the story of Ukrainians and uh, Russians being the same people. Some of the demographic fears also explain the totally violent anti-gay propaganda and others on the level of uh, Russian governments, because for everybody who has been in uh, Russia, they know this is not the sexually most conservative part of the world I have seen. Uh, so this is, uh, the, this is a society with a very high divorce rates. Uh, this is a society which is kind of a much more promiscuous. This is not the Bible Belt. At the same time, you have this major obsession. And part of this obsession is you have a nation that had the feeling that they are missing their children. And this obsession with demography and seeing the Ukrainians and Belarusians as part of the ethnic and demo demographic body of the, of the Russian state, in my view, is explaining better than some other type of a motivations first why Russians did it, why they did it now, but also why they don't know exactly what to do next. So I'm going to stop here. <laughs>